What's up, the social fam? Um, congratulations, summer is here. I believe most of you, if not all of you, are pretty much done with school. If not, you should be finishing up this week. You made it, you survived one of the craziest school years you will ever know about or experience in your life. So, I know a lot of you have got a questions. The summer's here, what's going on? I've heard that we're opening back up, phase one, phase two. Our government's kind of telling us, hey, it's okay to open back up. So, what does it look like for us to meet face to face? Let me give you a quick update. First of all, continue to pray for us as we see God's guidance and direction on how to open back up as a church and as a ministry, specifically at your campus, at our campus. Um, we have been praying through what this looks like. We still don't have a definite time frame of when we as a ministry are going to be opening back up. Phase two is happening soon, and our goal, our plan right now tentatively is at some point throughout phase two for us to open back up as a ministry. So we will let you know as soon as that happens, trust me. But in the meantime, we are going to continue to trust and know that God is moving and working during this season. We're going to remember verses like Romans 8, 28 that says, and we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we're going to dive a little bit into that scripture a little bit more tonight um, as we continue through the life of Joseph. Now, last week, Pastor James brought that fire and he gave us a word talking about how our temporary pleasures can cause a uh, long-term pain and it's not worth the long-term pain. And that was such a good word for, so if you haven't checked out that message, I want to encourage you to go back and look through that. Tonight, we're going to be talking about and making sense of suffering in our lives. Um, Joseph is such a great example of what it looks like to suffer well and what it looks like when suffering comes upon you um, as a believer and as a Christian. So I don't know about you, but I've gone through a lot of suffering in my life. Sometimes it's been emotional suffering. Um, I've gotten phone calls that friends and family members have passed away. Um, I have actually been in the room when family members have taken their last breath. Um, I have uh, grown up, my parents have, my, my parents divorced, and so I went through what that looked like for me, suffering emotionally through that, my parents divorced. Um, and also I was made fun of at times as a kid, and you know, maybe you find yourself in a lot of those similar situations. I've also been through a lot of physical sufferings. Um, I've, I've separated my shoulder, almost need surgery. I had surgery on my finger, which I talked about several weeks ago, just about how I shattered my finger playing football. Um, I have a plate in my finger, and so I've been through some physical sufferings as well. I've been in a car accident, car accidents before, and so maybe you can relate in those ways. And those emotional and physical sufferings has also brought upon like spiritual, spiritual sufferings for me, places of doubt and frustrations and questioning and um, maybe even anger or bitterness towards God himself. Um, but ultimately, God has used... Uh, suffering in my life, and I know that he uses it in all of our lives, and we're going to look through that um, as we dive more into the life of Joseph, because over the, fast, the past few weeks, we've seen these highs and lows in Joseph's life. We've seen some ups and some downs, right? He goes from being the favorite son with some really cool jacket to being a hated brother who sold into slavery to then being given power as a slave and authority um, and, and given a nice job by Potiphar, and then last week we, we studied and learned about how Potiphar's wife wrongly accuses him and because Joseph does the right thing and flees and runs away from temptation it ended up costing him his freedom and he goes back into prison now sometimes students hear this you can do the right thing and the consequences 
will still be that you would not receive blessings. Maybe sufferings are still the consequences of you even doing the right thing, just like Joseph experienced. And I want to challenge you and encourage you throughout this time as you're praying through, what does suffering look like for me and God? How can I make sense of suffering to look through Joseph's life? Because, you got, guys, you got to understand that Joseph allowed suffering to draw him closer to God. And we have two choices when we suffer. We can either run from God or run to God. Joseph chose to run to God. And what he discovered when he ran to God was that he was closer to God than he ever was before. And he ultimately realized that it was the suffering that brought him closer to God. And in many ways in our lives, students, this is the one thing that I want you to know, to hear, and to remember tonight. Your suffering will take you places that your blessings can't. Your sufferings will take you places your your blessings can't. Joseph understood that. Without the sufferings in Joseph's life, Joseph would have remained prideful, selfish, jerk, who only worried about himself. And as Joseph began to experience suffering in his life, that verse in Romans 8, 28 And we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him and been called according to his purpose. That verse began to come alive. And that verse hadn't even been written yet in Joseph's day. But yet it's because of Joseph's life that we even have verses like Romans 8, 28. Students, when you don't know what to do, remember that your problems can position you for a purpose. And that's what we're seeing as we dive into Joseph's life. His problems, his suffering, they positioned him for a specific purpose. Too often in life, we want the easy way out. We want God to please bring us more comforts and remove the suffering. But I don't think that what we realize is we're actually saying, God, we don't really want to be close to you. We won't realize that when we're saying, God, give me more comfort, give me less suffering, protect me always, and bless this nasty food that's not good for my body, but bless it and make it taste good and make us feel better because of it. God, what we're actually saying in all of this is take away the suffering. Don't allow bad things to happen. What we're actually saying is don't let me be close to you. I don't want to draw close to you, and I don't want what sufferings bring. Students, your sufferings will take you places that your blessings can't recognize the suffering in your life as an opportunity to grow closer to God. The sufferings in your life are opportunities for God to work in and through you. So let's set up the story where we are today. So last week we know Joseph ends up back in prison because he's wrongly accused. But while he's in prison, he doesn't just have this woe is me mentality. My life is terrible. I can't believe these things happen. Oh, no, what am I going to do? No, he's trusting God in the midst of that. And it even says in Genesis 39 at the end there that the, the jailer there, the chief jailer, put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners because he knew and saw that God was with Joseph. That's the attitude that Joseph had while in the midst of suffering, that he wanted to be used by God, and God used him in mighty ways. So God continued to bring him back to positions of authority and put him in the place of purpose. And so Joseph has been in prison now, and what happens is the the pharaoh or the king of Egypt gets all kinds of mad at two people, the cupbearer and the bread maker, the baker. And those two people who are right next to Pharaoh all the time, for some reason he gets ticked at them and throws them into prison. And what happens? They immediately are thrown into prison under Joseph's command. And let's see what happens as they are in prison. So in Genesis 40, starting in verse 4, it says this. After they had been in custody for some time, Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. Each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. 
So basically what happens is these two guys have a dream. They both have separate dreams that need somebody to interpret them, and nobody knows how to interpret them. So they're all upset. They're like, man, they're distraught by these dreams. What do they mean? And Joseph comes to them, and immediately he points them to God. Immediately he says, God can interpret dreams. Why don't you tell me what they say? Because God was with him, and he understand that, and he lived through that, in his suffering, he allowed God to move and work through him. So basically, the first one, the cupbearer, tells him his dream, and, and Joseph interprets him. He's like, basically like, yo, cupbearer, this is what's about to happen, okay? In three days, you're going to be giving your job back. And when you're giving your job back, don't forget your boy Joseph. That's what he tells him. So then the, the baker's like, man, he just told the cupbearer good news. Maybe he's got some good news for me. Hey, Joseph, what does my dream mean? And he tells the baker, look, bro, I'm sorry. I hate to tell you this, but in three days... You're going to be killed, and your flesh is going to be fed to the birds. Whoa, that escalated quickly. And, then, and just as Joseph says, happens. The cupbearer in three days, it's Pharaoh's birthday. He throws his party. He ends up inviting the cupbearer to come back and to have his job back. And in the same way, the baker is killed, and his flesh is fed to the birds. Now, check out. Do you think the cupbearer remembered him, remembered Joseph, remember what Joseph did for him? Check out verse 23 in Genesis 40. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Joseph sat in prison, y'all, for another two years. Two more years of suffering. Two more years of questioning. What the heck, God? This doesn't make sense. I don't understand why you're allowing this to happen. I did what I thought you wanted me to do. I interpreted these dreams. I pointed you as the one who gives the power to do that. I gave you the glory. I didn't take it for myself. And yet here I am still in prison. Students, you may feel like that at times. You may feel like you maybe do the right thing and you lose some friends over it. You may feel like you did the right thing by helping somebody else and it ended up costing you something else in return. But God is moving and working like you do not even see yet. Your problems will position you for the purpose that God has for you. You know, somewhere along the way, Joseph realized that God was working all things together for the good. Every single letdown, every single frustration, every single disappointment, God was using it. I want to share a personal testimony of my own life. When I was your age, um, you know, as I said before, my parents split up, and it caused me to have to transfer to some different schools and to go to some different places. I've mentioned some of that before in previous weeks, but um, I had a dream going up that I wanted to be a professional athlete. I love sports. All I did was play sports. I literally wore basketball shorts underneath all my clothes all the time so that at any moment, basketball game was about to pop off, whew, I was ready to go. Let's ball out. Let's go. Let's do it. And all I did was play sports. My life was about sports. I watched sports. I eat sports. I drank sports. I lived sports, I played sports, I practiced sports, it's all that I wanted to do. Now, fast forward, I wanted to have a letterman, I wanted to go to high school, I wanted to have the accolades, I wanted to get that letterman, I just thought they were so cool looking. And I remember my opportunity when I was going into my 10th grade year, I was going to start playing at Bonneville, I had to transfer and go there, um, and I started practicing over the summer doing these summer workouts, and coaches started to kind of notice me because, you know, I was a decent player. And then one day, the coach calls me in his office, and he says, hey, Michael, listen, I talked to the principal about you, and we have a problem. Uh, you don't live in the district. You live out the district. So that means you've got to sit out a year, and you're not going to be able to play this year. You have a year of eligibility. Um, but, you know, if you want to stick around, uh, I got some water that you can kind of, you know, help us. We need a water boy, so you can be the water boy. And I immediately was like, I am not a water boy. Thanks, coach. I get it. But, you know, and I walked out of there completely devastated. I remember I called my mom and I was devastated. I was crying and I said, mom, they won't let me play. They won't let me play because I live out the district. I can't play. I can't play. I need you to come pick me up. And students, that was honestly one of the most disappointing moments in my life. But here's what I want you to see. And here's how something that God has helped me realize in and through that suffering in my life. Yes, my expectations were not met. Yes, I was a little disappointed. In fact, I was very disappointed. However, had that not happened, I would not be here today. I would not be a student pastor. Let me tell you why. Because I didn't play sports in school, ended up getting a job, 
And I also ended up getting a lot more involved in my youth ministry. I started serving. I started being uh, a leader. And then the next thing you know, I picked up a guitar. I started learning and teaching myself how to play guitar. And a few months later, I was leading worship at church. And God used those opportunities to bring me other opportunities. People started finding out I led worship. They asked me to come lead worship. I started leading worship for different churches. God gave me in internships. And I went and lived in different states. And I traveled and went to different countries on mission trips. And God took me places I never thought I could go. But it started with my suffering. It started with me understanding that God was going to use my suffering to take me places that my blessings could not take me. And to a deeper relationship with God. And not only that, I mentioned that I got a job. You know, one of the jobs that I had while I was in high school was working at Krispy Kreme. I love Krispy Kreme donuts. You know, there's nothing like taking one of them hot glaze off the line, walking over to that melted chocolate, dipping it in there, and just, um, it's so good, y'all, so good. It's the best. So, but while I was at Krispy Kreme, I met some people. I worked with some people, and I tried my best to be a light to them, people who needed encouragement, needed to see God in and through my life. So I tried. I, I wasn't perfect at it. But as I got older, believe it or not, God continued to use me in those people's lives. And do you know that today, right now, in our ministry at the social and our Kenner campus, there is at least two students that I know of that I worked with their parents at Krispy Kreme. And God used me years later to plant seeds in their lives. And now their kids are part of church, are part of our ministry, are part of what's going on. Students, that's not an accident. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make accidents. He uses the suffering in our lives to draw us closer to him, to take us places that our blessings can't take us. And in your life right now, you're experiencing some sufferings. Maybe your disappointments are, are, are ailing you and they're hurting you and they're causing such frustration. Do not allow that to draw you away from God. That's exactly what the devil wants. Allow the seasons of suffering in your life to draw you closer to God and recognize that God is going to use sufferings to take you places your blessings can't. Students, I was absolutely devastated when I was younger that I did not get to accomplish the goals that I had set out for myself. But then because of that happened and God helped me realize that his goals for me were much higher than my own goals, my own aspirations. The choices that I made in suffering affected hundreds, maybe even thousands, tens of thousands of people's lives to come. People I had never even met yet. And the choices you make today can affect long-term people way later. Just like in Joseph's life, years went by. And God brought him to positions where he was used uh, uh, to, to, to solve problems, to help others. And God used Joseph in the midst of his sufferings. The decisions you make today may affect people you haven't even met yet. And I want to encourage you in the midst of your suffering, when you don't know what to do, remember that your problems can position you for a purpose. Joseph's decisions to flee temptation ended up costing him time in prison. But yet while he was in prison, his decision to interpret the dreams for those two guys ultimately led him back to Pharaoh. Because as we'll see next week, that these guys, the cupbearer actually did remember him, introduced him to Pharaoh. Pharaoh has a dream, and God uses Joseph to interpret that dream and to save a country the greatest country in all the known world at the time, and put him second in command. God took Joseph, not back home in freedom. He didn't remove and bring everything back. And your suffering in your life doesn't just mean that, well, one day God's going to remove it all and you'll just be able to go back to the way things were. We may never just go back to the way things were, but yet God is going to take us places greater than we ever thought we could go. And God is going to use you in ways that you never thought you could be used. So in this season, during this time, I want to challenge you with a couple things. I want to challenge you to pray and seek the Lord's face. Ask God to reveal to you how he wants to show you your purpose in this world. Use the sufferings that you may be experiencing right now to point you to a position of purpose. And remember, students, that God is going to use suffering in your lives like in a way that blessings cannot. 
And I want to encourage you to pray and memorize Romans 8.28. That's the second thing I want to challenge you to do. Memorize God's word. Memorize Romans 8.28, that God works together in all things for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you hold on to that scripture when times get tough and know that God is at work in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you and I praise you for tonight. Thank you for these students. Move in a mighty way. Use the suffering in their life to bring them places that their blessings can't, God, and remind them of the purpose that you're going to fulfill in and through them as they draw near to you in the midst of their sufferings, God, that you would draw near to them, Father. Right now, in this season, May 2020, I pray that you would encourage them, lift them up, and remind them that the decisions they make today can affect thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the future, God. Raise up the next generation of young people that are so madly in love with you that they will see suffering as really, truly a blessing. We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.